Well, good morning and welcome. So glad, to, so glad to see all of you. So glad that you've taken the time to come and join us here in this beautiful sanctuary that we can enjoy. I want to just take just a quick minute. There were two guys that showed up yesterday, Ray Thompson and Wayne Barker, and they made this space look like our worship space. They, they cleared the leaves, they mowed the yard, they did all that work, and then Les came up here and blew it all and made it look just great this morning. So can we say thank you to those guys who do, do that work? Not just this week, but every week we have a team that comes up and takes care of our property, um, and this is a beautiful, beautiful space. And so I want to welcome you into your sanctuary this morning. I want you to take just a quick moment, look around, take a deep breath, and recognize that this is safe space, and that this is the place where we can all together meet with God this morning. You're welcome in this space. So no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. No matter your age or the color of your skin, you are welcome here. No matter your marital status or sexual orientation, you are welcome here. No matter your abilities or special needs, you are welcome here. No matter your gender identity or citizenship or immigration status, you are welcome here. No matter your emotional state, your zip code, your level of education or affluence, you are welcome here. If you believe some of the time, none of the time, or all of the time, you are welcome here. Come, friends. Let's gather around the table of Jesus together because you are welcome here. I invite you let the, for all of us to join in worship together. So this song's called Simple Gospel. Um... <laughs> To me, this song is really about just kind of stripping away anything extra and really just focusing on your connection with God. Um, so I would just, it's very, very straightforward. You got the words in front of you. So either hum, sing along, uh, speak along, however you'd like to. So. I don't measure up 
Lord, I've been told I'm not good enough, but you're here with me. And I reach out and you find me in the dust. And they say no amount of untruths can separate us. And I reach out and I reach out and Say no amount of untruths can separate us, and I will rejoice in the simple gospel. I will rejoice in you, Lord, and I will rejoice. In the simple gospel, and I will rejoice in you, Lord. The next song we're going to do is called Yahweh. If you choose to sing with it, uh, please feel free. Uh, also feel free just to meditate with it. It's a beautiful song, though.
So this is the bridge. you pray with me? Living God, we might just choose to pray with our eyes open today. That we could look around and we could see this beautiful space. That we could look around and we could see these beautiful faces. Lead us on this day Though challenges surround us, lead us on this day to gratitude, to thanksgiving. For there is much to be thankful for. For we are surrounded in so many different ways with gifts. God, we thank you for your incredible love for us. We thank you for the ways that you are present for us each and every day. If we would just turn our attention towards you, if we would take quiet moments, if we would take walks in the park, if we would quiet ourselves and center our spirits, then we could tap in, be reminded of a greater reality, a greater story that we're a part of, that you are more than present, that there is a harmony to this life even in this moment, even in this difficult moment, that there is a harmony and a beauty to life. God, might we also be reminded as we look left of the, the relationships that sustain us, that encourage us, that make us laugh, that make us hope, that show up at our doorstep when we need a friend that call us on the phone, that send us a silly emoji to just remind us that, hey, I'm thinking about you. I'm with you. You're not alone. God, we thank you for this church family. Might we not be prisoners of this moment? This moment will pass. But God, live as people of faith, ready to stand, to speak, to be a part of your good work. God, might we be listening and ready to join you. God, give us ears to hear, eyes to see. May your spirit be so evident in this place. We long to, to hear from you. We love you, O oh God. Be honored 
in our time here. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. So we're going to talk a little bit today about uh, the verses that I'm assuming Chad's sermon is about. And uh, a lot of the books in the Bible were written by a, an early church person named Paul. And uh, these verses were probably written while he was in prison. And he wrote letters to churches that he had helped start to encourage them. So he's in prison for being a Christian, and he's encouraging other people. That's pretty amazing. But uh, these verses in Ephesians uh, chapter 6, 10 through 20 talk about he en encourages them to wear God's armor at all times. And so uh, Clara and her, her friend Presley, and, and who is this young man? Gavin. I, I didn't recognize you with your mask on. So um, what do you think of when you hear the word armor? Gavin? You think of a knight? Ooh, yeah, a big... Somebody who's protected for battle. So, uh, Gavin, do you have any uh, favorite superheroes? Who, who would be your favorite superhero? Spider-Man. Spider what, kind of, what kind of armor does Spider-Man have? So, Gavin's saying that uh, Spider-Man's powers come from a, a spider that bit him. And so what kind of things does he have? Web shooting, basic spider stuff, you know. Okay. And uh, do you do, know this from the comic books or from the movies? From the movies and games. So after uh, Tony Stark hooks up with him, does he get like some actual armor and protective stuff as well? Okay. All right. And you, young lady? Do you have a, any favorite superheroes besides Olivia the Unicorn? Wonder Woman. Oh, she's awesome. Although my daughter might say that she's she's not Marvel, she's DC. So, um, what do you like about Wonder Woman? Just because she's got awesome girl power? Yeah. That's pretty good stuff. So uh, Clara and uh, Presley are going to pass these out. and Unfortunately for me, they're giving up the Captain America mask. So go ahead and share those. What are some uh, – so Paul isn't asking us to put on uh, actual, super, you know, superhero armor, but – what are some, uh, wh he's talking about wearing our spiritual armor at all times. Gavin, what do you think an example of spiritual armor would be? Faith. That's very good. So faith is, you know, believing without proof is a, is a good way to, to keep spiritually strong and protected. Clara, what's another spiritual armor? Prayer, good job. So that, and that's listed in the verses. So um, another one that I thought of when I was, you know, thinking about this was uh, right here, um, surrounding yourself. Because in in a lot of the the good Marvel movies, uh, one of the conflicts that the the Marvel superheroes go through is they get set against each other by the evil. The evil pits, you know. Uh, Captain America and Thor against Tony Stark, who is Iron Man, who has lots of armor. Um, he's all about armor. Um, and then at the end, they ultimately realize that by staying together with their their spiritually like friends, and, and for us that would be our, our, our fellow Christians. Sometimes we Christians get, get split apart and go against each other, but we're always going to be stronger together. Well, thank you, uh, Clara and... Presley and Gavin and Samantha. It's the mask hearing. Sometimes our uh, armor doesn't help us so, in, in certain ways. So uh, if you two will virtually join me in prayer with our hands. Dear Lord, thank you for protecting us 
with prayer and faith in our Christian community and in other other ways that that you help us to to stand up to evil. Amen. And I reach out and find me in the dark. This ain't no amount of untruths can separate us. And I reach out. And I'll reach out and find me in the darkness. How can I say no more? How can I begin to grow? How can I begin to Well, this morning, we, uh, we conclude a teaching series entitled, Come Unity. And uh, if you've been watching online, or if you're watching online right now, if you've been coming to our services, um, we know that we've been working our way through the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. Um, in my lifetime, unity has never felt so far away. Um, There's so many different division points that we're encountering in this unique moment in history, and yet Paul speaks a word of hope. This letter can resound not just in that day, but this, that in Christ, he begins the letter with all of these different things that happen in Christ, because of Christ, through Christ, in Jesus, anything's possible, he said. We can do anything. And so we're invited by God into being peacemakers, into being reconcilers, into being healers, into being world changers. Now, I can get stirred up about that. I can get excited about joining God in something so extraordinary as to look into the abyss and to look into all of the challenges that we face And to be told, no, you can be a part, you can be a key part, we can be a key part in moving towards something hopeful. Two weeks ago, I I challenged you guys after the election. Um, I challenged you to step out and to bridge the gap. This political divide seems as wide as it's ever been. And, and so I challenged you to go out of your way to try to extend an olive branch, uh, extend a kindness, write a note, sit down and have coffee with someone who voted differently from you. And several of you, several of you guys did it. Uh, several of you did it, whether it was at a lunchroom or whether it was uh, at, at, in college or whether it was um, a, a neighbor across a fence or a family member for some of you. And you, you shared with me that it was not an easy experience. 
There was a lot of difficulty. There seemed to be a great divide between you. So there was this struggle that you encountered in trying to engage the struggle. Well, I invite you to join me. I want you to join me in our last passage here in Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 10. Um, Paul is writing, concluding his letter. Let's start off in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord, Paul says, and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of of blood and flesh, but against the rulers of but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, and then again he says, stand therefore. So Paul's trying to figure out how to wrap it up. He's trying to wrap up his letter, trying to figure out how is he going to do that? How is he going to really bring his audience to where his his final destination? And so what he does is he, he draws upon his preaching experience. Now, any good preacher knows that if you if you can't land a message, you haven't accomplished a lot. If you can't bring it down to the people, you can't leave it up, you know, 2,000 years ago. You can't leave it uh, in, in, in a land far, far away. You got you to gotta bring it down. You got to be able to land or you, well, you've lost your opportunity. And so Paul decides that he's going to bring it down to the people. And so in verse 12, you can see it in your worship guide. I'm going to work through these verses with you today. In verse 12, Paul talks about the struggle. And this is a struggle that we're all familiar with. It's a struggle of living the life of faith. It's a struggle of being the church, especially when you're, when the the opposition seems so evident. And all of us know what the struggle feels like. We all know what it feels like when when we have have set our course and we're trying to line up our lives with God and live, live a life of faith and honor God with our values and our choices. And yet there's something, you know what I'm talking about, some kind of some kind of power, some kind of influence, some kind of temptation that 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 seems to be pushing us in a different direction. Do you know what I'm talking about? When you're trying to choose the path of God once again, and yet you sense that something is working against you. Okay, nod your head. I can't see your faces except for your eyes. So I know that all of us have experienced that at different points, for sure. Amen. Amen is right. Some of us call this... um, spiritual warfare. There are those that, that call this battle, this sense of conflict, spiritual warfare. I have a good friend of mine um, that, that literally his lens for life is that, is that there is a battle going on. In every single struggle, every challenge that he faces, he believes that it is the power of darkness that is somehow attacking him, and so he has to make the choice of choosing the light or, or following God, and there's this battle that's going on. I remember one time when we went to the, uh, to the mall together, and we, we were walking in, and, and uh, there was a man that came up to us, and he needed some help with some lunch, and so he was asking for some money. And so my friend, immediately upon his request, he, he starts praying first about whether we should help the guy, he should help the guy, and then he said, okay, yeah, I should help the guy. How much should I? So he's praying about, like, how much should I help him with? And, and somehow he came upon the number $1.37. I kid you not, he came to the, it's $1.37, and I'm a smart aleck, so I immediately go, not $1.38? But, but he was so confident that that was exactly what he was supposed to give, and so we, we like, you know, empty our pockets. I mean, who brings change anywhere any day? And so we have a, have a dollar. Things happen outside, no worries. 
So, so we, got, we have a dollar, and then we figure, okay, I've got a quarter, and you have a nickel, and we got, have to find pennies. Who has pennies? And, you know, so we finally get a dollar thirty-seven, and we put it in the man's hands, and he's, of course, looking at us like, you've got to be joking. What can I buy with a dollar thirty-seven? And, and, and so we give him the dollar thirty-seven, and he, and he uh, kind of looks at us, and God bless you, and he goes on his way, and, and as he walks off, I slip him a five. Because what can you buy with a dollar thirty-seven? So some of us might be thinking of my friend and be like, "Okay, I don't, I don't really get what." But but my friend, and there's something really honorable about this is that is that in every part of life he wants to honor God. He wants to choose light, and there's something really beautiful and pure about that. And yet, I think maybe he's going to an extreme that wasn't the intention. But let me ask you the question, is the opposite a better choice? Is it better for us to completely, completely deny the presence of the struggle? The presence of spiritual powers that that might move us away from God, is it better? C.S. Lewis actually writes about this, it's really interesting. He says, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils, he calls them. One is to disbelieve their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in their presence. They themselves are equally pleased, they themselves being the devils, are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. Lewis's point is, is quite interesting. He suggests that it is an equal error to be overly infatuated with these powers of darkness as it is to say that they don't exist at all. And so you might even take a little assessment of yourself right now, and you might think to yourself, so where do I fall on that continuum? Am I among the ones that just say, ah, the forces of evil, that, that, that doesn't really exist? Or am I those that are overly infatuated, or am I somewhere in the middle? Paul actually gives us a little bit of wisdom in the chapter right before we looked at it two weeks ago. He says, be careful how you live your life. Be be wise. Live as the wise, not the unwise. Remember, we're talking about wisdom as it's seen biblically is 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 the ability to see things clearly, to see life, to be able to see our choices, to see what the good path the healthy path really is. So against, amidst the struggle, Paul gives us some instruction. Look at your, look at the verses in our worship guide again. Paul gives us some instruction about how to, how to endure during this struggle or what we should do during this struggle. Can, it's said like four different times. Do you, do you see it? Do you see what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to stand. Histemi is actually the, the Greek word there, histemi. We're supposed to stand. People of faith, the church, we are supposed to stand. We're supposed to stand up. We're supposed to stand our ground. We're supposed to stand firm. Three, four different times he used some variation of that exact same word. We are supposed to stand. We are not supposed to be bystanders to history. We're supposed to be active participants. This is the intention that Jesus had for his followers, that we would take up the cause of Jesus and get in a little bit of trouble from time to time. A few weeks ago, I had the opportunity. How many of you have seen Good Trouble, the documentary Good Trouble? Um, Our Thursday group that meets at noon on Thursday, we decided to watch that and then discuss it um, on Thursday, it's the uh, it's the uh, the biography um, of the late Congressman John Lewis. John Lewis grew up in a context to where he was constantly surrounded by racial inequity, prejudice, hatred, ignorance, and it could have been so easy for John Lewis to just be overwhelmed by the enormity of what his experience was to where he just sat down and said, this is not something that I can really tackle. This is not something that I can handle. It's too big for me. 
But the thing that's so inspiring about John Lewis's story is that he stood up over, and he's a guy that stands about right here. And he stood up over and over and over again, getting in good trouble. Let me read you a, a little quote from his book. Do not get lost in a sea of despair. Be hopeful, be optimistic. Our struggle is not with the struggle of a day, a week, a month, or a year. It's a struggle of a lifetime. Never, ever be afraid to make some noise, to get in good trouble, necessary trouble. I hope that our church can get in some necessary trouble from time to time. I hope that we can have our ears open and be responsive, ready to stand when God calls us, when, when the way of Jesus calls us to stand and to speak with power, with conviction, even if it gets us in trouble. I hope that we're ready to do that. Paul calls us to stand over and over and over, stand. How do we stand amidst the struggle? Uh, Paul it's very clear that, that Paul is writing from his context, okay? So he's in prison. He's constantly surrounded by Roman soldiers. And so what he does is he builds a metaphor, a striking metaphor about the armor of God. Now, I have kind of just a natural dislike for this imagery. Um, I think it makes a lot of Christians uncomfortable. And let us be very, very clear. The, the imagery of battle armor as it has to do with violence, is inconsistent with Jesus. Jesus was an activist. Jesus was a radical. Don't get, I mean, make no bones about it, but his ways never were consistent with the ways of violence. He knew that the world would not change when violence just meets violence and it perpetuates itself. It had to be done through peacemaking. There had to be peaceful means so do Christians really need soldiers' garb? Marva Dawn actually has, has something interesting to say about this. She says, Tell me that following Jesus and praying for our enemies and turning the other cheek and forgiving endlessly is not, in many respects, a life embattled. She makes a really good point. Because following Jesus is going to put us at odds with the world from time to time. The ways of Jesus are not consistent completely with the ways of Kingwood, Texas, with the ways of Houston, Texas, with the ways of the United States, or the ways of the world, that we're going to be at times called to a new and different path. So, let's get into this armor of God for a moment. So, Paul talks about six pieces of armor. Now, I want to, I want to remind you, uh, or draw your attention to the fact that five out of the six pieces of armor, five out of the six are defensive. They're defensive in nature. And, and, and one of them is defensive and offensive. So, so he wants to make sure that we know what these pieces of armor are really for. So let's get into this. I'm just going to, I'm going to highlight um, these different pieces of armor. The first is the belt of truth. Now, the belt is, as you know, it's the thing that holds everything together. For some of us, including, including me, that um, is deficient in a backside, that's what my wife tells me, I need a belt or maybe my pants would fall down. So um, the belt is really what holds everything together. Um, it holds everything in place, and especially for somebody in a suit of armor, they, their, 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 uh, their sword hangs on the belt, their tunic is held in place by a belt, and so Jesus, if we're thinking about the belt of truth, Jesus asked his disciples, he says, who do you say that I am? What's the truth about me? See, I, I believe our belt of truth, friends, people of faith, our belt of truth is our confession. It's who we say Jesus is and what he calls us to do. It's the thing that holds everything together. A lot of things fall apart when we start questioning our, our primary confession, commitment to follow, to believe and follow in the ways of Jesus. So he goes on, breastplate, breastplate of righteousness. So we know that the breastplate, just like those that, that uh, Stan handed out, the breastplate covers this part of the body, the main kind of 
uh, essential parts, the heart, all of the organs. It, 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 pre- it preserves the life of the soldier, but it's a breastplate of righteousness. Now, righteousness is, a, is kind of a churchy word that some of us might not know the, the definition of. Righteousness is essentially talking about our relationship with God, the, a right relationship with God. And so, the way that the way that we wear our breastplate of righteousness is to recognize not, not what we say about, about God, but what God says about us. It guards our heart. What God says about us, about our relationship with God, is that we are loved and that we are valuable and that we are good. No matter how many times you've been told the contrary, Trent even sang about it here just a moment ago, how often we're told the contrary. God looks at us and says, you are good at your core, at your heart. You are good. You are my child. And so that serves to stabilize. It it keeps our heart beating that God looks at us in that way. He moves on to the shoes. Shoes ready to stand. Ready to stand for what? Ready to stand for what? What does it say? What are the shoes ready to stand for? Peace. Ready to stand for peace. It affirms a God who is always working in peaceful ways. Harnessing the power of sacrificial love. Always ready to stand for peace. Not rush into battle. Not not rush to violence. But rush to peace. Always working for peace. Then he moves on. The shield of faith. Now, to do a little bit of research behind the shields, the Roman shield, some of you guys might already know this, but they were made of leather. And actually, before the Roman soldiers would go into battle, they would wet them down. Why would they wet them down? It's hidden there in the text. There are flaming arrows that are coming their way, right? And so they wet down the leather so it won't catch fire. Another really interesting part about their, their shields is the fact that they are wide enough to not only cover the, their, their person, but also a third of the person next to them. So the shield of faith, the shield of faith is, is linked. It's like in the same way that they're linked together, they, they actually cover not only themselves, but the person next to them. And that person covers half themselves and the person next to them. And so they stand in strength together. Their faith is strong together. I don't know about you, but these last nine months, I have hurt in my own faith because I haven't haven't been able to be with you. I haven't been able to draw upon the collective strength of the community, the faith of the community. And so many of us have felt depleted because we haven't been able to gather, we haven't been able to encourage each other the way that we were in past months. And so we pray that that can happen, but it's, let it serve as a reminder of how important it is to be a part of a faith community. We stand strong together when we are so weak on our own. Finally, the, uh, the helmet of salvation, the translation that of that is so much better as the helmet of, of the Savior, the helmet of the Savior. So literally the image is when we put that put that. Um, that helmet on, we're putting on the very countenance, the very mind of Christ. That we're taking upon ourselves the, the, thought, the thought processes, the values. We're seeing the world through the eyes of Christ. And then the sword. Finally, the sword. And if you look at it there in the scriptures, it talks about the sword. Uh, the sword is uh, the sword of the spirit, which is what? What is it? The word. That term is logos. It's not talking about the scriptures. Paul's not talking about the scriptures. He doesn't know he's writing the scriptures. He's referring actually to the logos, the one that transcends. He's referring to the, the, the wisdom of God that we see embodied in Jesus. And so what happens with the sword, Jesus, if Jesus is the sword, his words, don't they cut right to the heart of matters? Isn't there a wisdom that is so far beyond ours that's a part of Jesus' words? 
And so that's how they cut, but they don't cut for the sake of destruction. They cut so that healing can take place, so that restoration can take place, so that necessary work that God wants to do inside of us individually, collectively can take place. So that's why the sword exists. So I want to allow, allow me to, to close with, with something I think Paul would make sure that we knew. And that is first, of course, we're called to stand. So remember that part. We're called to stand over and over and over. The second thing would be we are called to pray. We are called to pray. In fact, we don't even know how to stand unless we pray. There are a lot of scholars that say that the entirety of the armory, that the armor of God is to help us pray. If you go back and you look at those different pieces of armor and you think about the way that they would protect you, they protect us so that we can be in relationship, in intimate relationship with the one that calls us good, the one that calls us valuable, the one that calls us just beautiful and, and, and son, daughter, so, so we're actually protected so that we can be in prayer together. Now, those two words like, so stand up and pray, they kind of sound like they're a little bit at odds with each other to a degree. But Richard Rohr would say differently. Rohr claims that not only, that only together do we understand those two things, to stand, how to stand, and then to pray. Oftentimes, unthoughtful action, and we've probably done this. I'm very, I'm, sometimes I can just get all passionate about something and I can just roar off out the door. And I'm going to say this, I'm going to do that. Anybody ever done that? How'd that work out? That work out okay? <laughs> Most of the time when we don't think about it, we just respond. There's just some emotion. We just jump up and we're going to, I'm going to go change the, uh, most of the time doesn't work out so well, Right? We go stumbling and bumbling out there and we're doing things and we're breaking stuff. But what happens when we prayerfully consider, I, I know that I need to respond the same way that our church, so many of you, you come to me and you say, gosh, how can we respond to this need? How can we respond to this need? How can we be, be a part of reconciliation? How can we be a part of, of, of bridging gaps? How can we be a part of, 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 of hosting healthy conversations? How can we do these things? And that's wonderful. And we say, let's, let's prayerfully consider those things. Let's be thoughtful about how we can do those things. When action finds prayerful grounding, then God's wisdom and ways, they just spring forth. And that ultimately is, is I hope, where we want to be. We don't want to stay just in a place where we're praying about stuff. And we don't want to launch out and do something that's going to be hurtful or destructive. We want to follow the gospel and follow with the wisdom of God out into our communities and be grounded and wise so that we can really participate in the healing and the reconciliation and the goodness that God wants to bring. Richard Rohr writes, ours is a beautiful struggle. Beautiful struggle. That is revealed when we seek to hold heaven and earth together through our love and faithfulness to God, humanity, and creation. This is our common path, friends. Our beautiful struggle that calls us to stand and pray, stand and pray, stand and pray. Maybe we can get in some good trouble together. So we're going to close out the sermon with, uh, with this familiar uh, prayer of Teresa of Avila. We've... Uh, this has kind of bound our sermon series together. Um, and so I invite you, because many of you know it, um, I invite you to sing along with me, Christ has no body but yours. So Tyler's going to come and, and provide some accompaniment for me. Right. 
Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he sees. Yours are the feet with which he walks. Yours are the hands with which he hisses all the world. Yours are the hands. Please sing with me. Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he sees. Yours are the feet with which he walks. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands. One more time. Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth yours. Yours are the eyes with which he sees. Yours are the feet with which he walks. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands. To come to the communion table. Each and every time that we come to this table, we encounter this extraordinary love that is embodied in the person of Jesus. And it's this, it's this image that is captured with that prayer that I just sang and that we sang together. It recognizes that Jesus set an example for us of sacrificial love. Jesus, over and over, throughout his life, he looked around and he identified needs that were around him, and he set aside his own interests. He set aside his own needs to meet the needs of someone else, to prioritize the needs of someone else. Margaret spoke about it wonderfully last week, about yielding, yielding to the need of someone else. And so we, when we come to this table today, we are called to remember his way and recommit ourselves to that same way of sacrificial love, giving away our power for the sake of someone else that needs. And so I invite you to take these little, these little packet in your, in, your, um, in your hand. We remember when Jesus met with his disciples and we, he took a loaf of bread, he blessed it and broke it. He said, this is my body broken for each of you. Take it and eat it, remembering me when you do. I invite you, take that wafer and eat and remember. Then Jesus took the cup and he said, this is my blood, the blood of a new covenant, a new relationship of forgiveness, grace, unmerited favor, given as a gift. And so I invite you to drink this new covenant, to reaffirm your commitment to not just believe, but to follow in the ways of Jesus. Let me pray for us. God, we are so grateful for this anchor of any worship service, this table. For the example that we remember and we reaffirm each time that we come. We want to be your body in our community. Nourish us, guide us, help us to be wise, help us to be courageous as we follow you. We love you. We thank you. We pray in the name of Christ.
Amen. Take away the melodies Take away the songs I sing Take away all the lines All the songs you let me write Does the man I am today Say the words you need to say Let them see you in me Let them hear you when I speak Let them feel you when I sing Let them feel you Let them feel you in me Without your grace, another smile, another face, another breath, a grain of sand passing quickly through the hand. I give my life in offering, take it all, take everything. Let them see you in me. Let them hear you when I speak. Let them feel you when I sing. Let them feel you. Let them feel you in me. With every breath I breathe, Sing a simple melody, but I pray we'll hear it in a song in me, in me. see you in me let them hear you when I speak let them feel you when I sing but let them feel you let them feel you in me let them feel you Good morning. When, uh, when I was in high school, I wasn't a fan of reading poetry in my English classes. And I know we have several for former uh, English teachers in the congregation, so, so my apologies, but I just could never get poems and poetry. I couldn't get the imagery and I couldn't get the symbolism. And I was just really, I, I never really developed an appreciation for it when I was in high school. And so my teachers were always talking about that sort of stuff. And all I wanted to know was what the darn poem meant. I wanted to know what the words on the page meant, not, not the hidden meaning and all that sort of stuff. And so the efforts of my teachers to open me to the richness of poetry fell on deaf ears. But over time, I developed somewhat of an appreciation for good poetry not necessarily the poetry that we had in those English books in high school. So when I first started reading the Bible, I experienced something similar. I couldn't see the richness of the stories, of the characters, or the many layers within it. Was I supposed to read it literally? What was I supposed to do with all these people who were living well into their hundreds? And then, then there, there were the parables of Jesus. 
like the poetry. I just wanted to Jesus wanted Jesus to tell me what he meant. I didn't want to have to try to figure it out. And so that was, you know, that was a challenge for me as a Christian reading, reading the Bible. So I, that's, I, I needed somebody to tell me what the poem meant, what the Bible meant, just like I was looking for that in my, in my high school English classes. And that's what, that's what good pastors do. They help us muddle through the many layers of, of biblical stories. And we're fortunate to have two really good, one here, good ones here at Kingwood Christian Church who can do it very well. Chad and Margaret have the ability to help us see behind the words on the page and to bring those words to life in a way that has meaning. They, bo- they both show how complex and beautiful the Bible is and how someone can approach it through a variety of different ways. They bring the teachings of Jesus to life. They bring the letters of Paul to life like, like, like Chad did this morning. And they do that while they're juggling other responsibilities, meeting the pastoral needs of the congregation, responding to board members, teaching Sunday morning classes. November is Pastor Appreciation Month at Kingwood Christian Church. And if you haven't showed Chad or Margaret how much you appreciate this, their leadership, I encourage you to do so over the next few days. Send them a note. Both their addresses are in your bulletin this morning. Maybe send them a gift to show your appreciation or just make a post on Facebook. But don't let this opportunity pass you by how much they mean to us here at Kingwood Christian Church. Thank you. As always, Make sure you are checking the weekly emails for all of the information on the events and the life of the church. I have a couple with which to remind you about today. First of all, again, to reiterate, Pastor Appreciation Month, the, their addresses are listed in the bulletin, so you may send cards to them and show them how much we appreciate them. We are doing a family Christmas candle. Please bring a candle from home that has meaning to your family around Christmas time. We will melt all the candles together to create one symbolic unity candle. No glass jar or candles, please. We need all candles by December 6th. You can bring them to service or drop them off at the office. Ham's season of sharing. Normally, we host a toy drive, but this year, Ham has asked for donations of $25 to Target or Walmart for gift cards. Ham will distribute the gift cards to families in need to provide food and toys this Christmas. Thank you to Kathy Gallagher for leading Ham's season of sharing. This week, the office will be closed Thursday and Friday for Thanksgiving. And then finally, today, after this service, we are going to be decorating the sanctuary for Christmas. If you are comfortable coming inside, please do help. You can hold off going to Cracker Barrel for a moment. Come on and join us. Everything is already in the the foyer here, so we don't have to scrounge around for all of the decorations. They're right there. Many hands make light work. And as you remember, this year we donated 400 and something turkeys to families in need. So we have a very special guest, our own turkey, who is somewhere. I have some theme music. Where's my theme music? I have some theme music. One more time. Okay. Here you go. Four hundred and fifty-six turkeys. Are you kidding me? You really, really wanted to see me in this, or maybe you didn't care at all and you just cared about the people in our community. Thank you guys so much. What an amazing, amazing, amazing success! And actually, Pam, would you come up here for just a moment? Pam Dixon is the executive director of Mission Northeast, and we presented her with a check just a, a little while ago for. For all of these turkeys, 456 turkeys. Thank you so much for coming out and being a part. Would you like to to say a quick word? You can can grab a mic if you'd like. 
Nope, this one is wrapped around. Here we go. Here we go. Good morning, and thank you all so very much. Um, I will quite honestly say that back in March and April, I thought we were going to tank this year. But our community has been so supportive and so generous and so faithful. And you all in particular have made this the best holiday season that we have ever had. This is the first time that we haven't had to go out and buy uh, certain items. Um, and you've given us enough turkeys, extra turkeys, uh, for Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I do want to talk, uh, mention one person that can really stand, and that's Miss Nancy back there, because she stood in line, I don't know how many times, at different grocery stores in order to buy those turkeys for us and put them in the trunk of her car <laughs> and bring them to us. So I wish all of you a very wonderful and safe, happy, happy Thanksgiving, and I really appreciate all of you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Pam. Appreciate it. It's our honor uh, to partner with Mission Northeast, and of course we partner with Ham and have so many other partners. You guys are amazing. You inspire me. Thank you so much for your generosity. Uh, the families of our community are going to feel that this, uh, this Thanksgiving season. All right. Most of y'all probably uh, don't know who I am, but my name is uh, Tyler. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much for having me today. I appreciate it. And uh, when Chad was telling me uh, it's going to be like a Thanksgiving type of service and we're we'll thinking things that we're grateful for, um, I think being grateful is an amazing thing. And I was thinking about all the different songs I could possibly play that were, you know, thankful or, you know, grateful for, you know, our life our health, our food, the things that, you know, we get together for Thanksgiving. And I couldn't think of a more appropriate song than this one right here. You plow the field and scatter the good seed on the land. It is fed and watered by God's almighty hand. He brings the snow in winter, the warmth to swell the grain. The breezes and the sunshine, the soft, refreshing rain. All good gifts surround us, are sent from heaven above. Then thank the Lord, oh thank the Lord, for all His love. Thank Thee then, O oh Father, for all things bright and good. The seed time and the harvest, our life, our health, our food. No gifts have we to offer, for all Thy love imparts. But that which Thou desirest, our humble, thankful heart. So thank the Lord, oh thank the Lord, for all His love. I really want to thank you, Lord. Oh, I want to thank you, Lord. Thank you for all of your life. I want to thank Thanksgiving too. You look great. <laughs> God bless you. God bless you and your families. Hope that you have a wonderful, wonderful Thanksgiving holiday in whatever unique form it might take. And we look forward to seeing you back next week. God bless you. Go in peace. <laughs>